Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear. We have John Hogue, the legend, with us from HogueProphecy.com. We're going to get into 2020 prophecies, predictions. We're going to talk about possible time travel. We'll call it quantum time travel. Now, John had these downloads of incredible proportions that are so intricate and detailed. He's going to describe that later about how in the future there could be possibly space-time travel where it's more like teleportation. And it's interesting that he brought that up because I have been thinking about that genre, not in the detail that he's going to mention, but it's funny how the matrix tends to, to bring things together. So it seems as if this was meant to be. We're also going to talk about the seven signs of recession right now. There's seven signs pointing towards a recession. Also, I'm here on the beach. So this is absolutely amazing. Really glad everybody could be here with us. John, how the heck are you? I'm doing great. Uh, you're you're just about four and a half hours from where I live, up in uh, up in Langley and Whidbey Island. Langley. Well, I've heard of that place. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the other Where's Langley. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, the other Langley. And before that, uh, I lived in Capitol Hill, the the other Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> oh, yeah. Olympia, right? Uh, no, Seattle. Oh, there's Capitol Hill in Seattle, too. I was thinking Capitol Hill and Olympia, and then, yeah, my bad. Yeah, because they were going to put the Capitol in Seattle on that hill back in the turn of the last century, and then they decided to put it in Olympia. Yeah, yeah. Olympia is a cool town. I like Olympia a lot, but it's just gotten so big after living in a small town in Colorado. Once you get to any place more than 2,000 people, I'm just like, oh, my goodness. This is scary. You know, I get scared when I see people now. It's, it's really weird. I used to, no, I'm just joking. Or am I? Let's do this, folks. Yelm, an incredible conference is coming up here in just a few days. Hope to see you there the 30th, the 31st, and the 1st. I'm going to be speaking. It's the UFO Symposium in Yelm. There's going to be some incredible vendors. There's going to be some great speakers. I'm going to be talking from 8.30 to 10.30, or it's 8.45 to 10.45. Just make sure to be there about 15 minutes early. You're going to love it. If you use the code LP for your tickets, you'll get a discount. And also, oh my goodness, this is incredible. John, did you know that if somebody's got a 401 or an IRA, they could actually turn that into into they can convert it into bitcoin now wow yeah hello know. ladies and gentlemen that's what i'm talking about john's as shocked as i am you can you can actually take your 401 or ira now and you can move it into not only precious metals but you can move it into cryptos and then you can move it all over the place you can do all sorts of things with it now it's incredible you should give my friends a call at noble gold investments see how it works it's incredible click the link in the video description box i'll even send you free books on it free material it's amazing now what you can do with your 401 and your ira and a lot of people including yourself that are going to share with us the seven signs of, po of a possible recession I remember back in 2008 when the stock market was doing, well, 2007-ish, the stock market was doing great. 2008, it really took a huge hit. People's 401s and IRAs also did so. And the gold, silver, precious metals, I noticed, went up a lot around that time. So people are certainly looking for other places to put their investments into always. And if that does happen, if we do see a recession, it'd be nice to see people be able to hold on to their hard-earned money is just find different places to put it. So ladies and gentlemen, click the links. And also, John, man, I mean, there's just so much going on right now with the, what I like to call politics, the natural disasters, the Amazon fires that are going on, so much going on. I mean, where do we start, man? Well, uh, first uh, that you've reminded me of something uh, that is just happening, just breaking now. Um, Hurricane Dorian looks like it may be a major hurricane that will hit almost all of Florida. First the main part and then come out through the Gulf and then hit the Panhandle. And so, so any, anybody in Florida be watching Weather Channel and other, other people because they got 24 seven reports now. I mean, it's just started a, a few hours ago. They're realizing the track is going there. So um, uh, the, the area is, is mostly looking like it's beating in on central Florida, but I really get a feeling this is going to be a big one. And uh, you know, that the hurricane season is going to end with a bang because we've, we have uh, come out of the El Nino cycle. Now we're in a neutral cycle, which means that's conducive for non wind shear winds, but very favorable winds and high pressures that slow down hurricanes and keep them over 
the target area for days. So, um, so everybody prepare for that by Sunday, landfall in Florida. And this, this weather is just hectic. I would not want to live in Florida. Oh man. Well, it may, you know, it, it's one of the areas I'm thinking that there's a possibility Panama could get hit again. And this kind of clicks into the things that I've often been writing about over the years at hogueprophecy.com that you have to, um, that there would come a period where I call it serial disaster, where you cannot, because of the changing climate, you don't get enough years between major disasters to recover. You're caught rebuilding. And it almost happened earlier today with uh, Puerto Rico. Everybody was traumatized. You know, a lot of the roofs in Puerto Rico still have blue tarps on them since Hurricane Maria a couple of years ago. So um, they were really afraid that the fragile uh, a grid would collapse again, but it just turned and moved and hit mostly the British Virgin Islands today and went due north rather than northwest where it would have dumped a lot of flooding rains on Puerto Rico. Um, that didn't happen. So, but it, it's, it, it's such a vulnerable place. And so are all the other uh, Caribbean nations and islands. And this is going to be more and more the case in the future. But the thing I, I, I think the hottest topic that's on a lot of people's minds now is what's going on with, with the economy. Now, I early, uh, I release to my readers at hogueprophecy.com an e-magazine, about 10 to 11 articles, about once or twice a month. Uh, and I usually look at big trends and I'm going to talk about the most recent one that, that's available and you can see it at hogueprophecy.com. That's H-O-G-U-E-P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y.com. And uh, there's a free section and there's also a, a, a pay section where you get to see all a whole bunch of other articles and extras. Um, so a lot of the themes that I'm going to talk about today are involved there. But one of the earliest uh, magazines that I put out in the beginning of the year was looking at the possibility of the trade war that is going on between China and, and America and how the... Uh, I looked at the astrology and I saw there was really a chance that by March, but especially the last chance by May for the leaders of the two countries and their negotiating teams to find a way to get out of this problem and resolve it. But there was a caveat. The caveat was that if the powers that be on both sides did not come to an agreement, and it continued, this escalation, which has continued, then that would bring the recession into this year potentially, not even next year or 2021, but we might begin, and I was saying this in the early part of the year that we might begin seeing it by September through October. So, so there's, I, I wanna first talk about three important signs you might call if this in, in a in apocalyptic light this is like the seven signs of the book of revelation only it's the revelation of lifting the veil on what could happen with our economy so the first thing i want to look at is this list and so there are basically seven things to to look at uh this the tariff war escalation after may has happened and that, that is a significant accelerant to the recession coming sooner rather than later. The second thing is um, the U.S. manufacturing sector is down, way down. Um, the third is that Germany, which I've said for about five years now in my writings, would be the first nation in Europe to go into recession. Germany, because of the shenanigans at the Deutsche Bank, um, um, I have now gone into a recession. They've had their first uh, growth, uh, negative growth quarter, third quarter by October. I predict that it will be a far deeper growth uh, deceleration that 
means uh, that they are officially, after two quarters, in a recession. They're saying they're not in it, but mark my words, by mid-October, and that'll be quite a blow to the European economy, they are coming into this recession. Whenever the economy of Europe sneezes, America catches a cold. So that's the third sign. The fourth sign, which is not being talked a lot about because it's often hidden from our eyes around the world, is the fact that China has built up a huge debt since the last recession. And the good side about that is that um, they're, they're feeling the pain as, as I, our leader had made it very clear and when I predicted that he might win by an upset 13 months before the presidential elections, um, he has basically uh, said that he would go full out into a trade war. And I talked a lot about it in my first of three books about him, um, that uh, it would be his greatest gamble, which could win him a second term, but if it's delayed and, and escalated and drawn deeper and deeper, it could lead to him not being elected in a second term. So the time when this could have really been good uh, was May. Uh, now, even if we get an agreement, because now China has done something quite radical, it has dropped the value of the yuan to its real level and it's the lowest it's been in 11 years. That is very significant. Um, there are maneuvers, what I'm seeing about this is that the two sides are desperate to find a way to save face and get out of this trade war because it's hurting. It's hurting China a lot. And it's hurting us too, but not in, a, not in such an obvious way. Um, the thing is that this, this thing uh, has to is really bringing to bear the Chinese debt crisis. Uh, and so uh, I'm hopeful that even now, in the next few months, we may see a resolution to this trade war between China and the United States. But unfortunately, the time to, to delay the recession coming into this year has already passed in May. So now it's coming maybe at the end of this year, but it's coming. And the steps are now the fourth sign. That was the fourth sign. The fifth sign to look at is the uh, is everything that's going to happen in Halloween in England, in the land of Uck, the UK, the United Kingdom, uh, with Bojo as Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Just did something today, asked the Queen to, to curtail to postpone or not have par, uh, House of Commons convene and basically uh, until the 15th of October, which means that only gives two weeks for the people who are trying to keep the United Kingdom in, into the uh, European Union will probably not have enough time to stop the cold, hard Brexit from happening. So that is also sending uh, uh, uncertainty into the European and American markets. Uh, it's especially uh, affecting the European GDP. So then the last two, the last two uh, steps are that we're already seeing. I talked about Germany, but we're already seeing other countries that are like canaries weak canaries, economically speaking, in the, in the uh, mining, in the, in the coal mine, are beginning, are already in recession. You have Argentina, it, South Africa, Turkey, and others as well. And I'll just quickly end with the seventh, the final one. Um, and that is uh, the one that got everybody's, most of everybody's attention when the bond markets looked at a certain telling sign it has been accurate for seven recessions in a row. That means we're anytime in the next 18 months in a recession. Uh, the bond markets are kind of in a tizzy right now. A lot of selling going on. There's a lot of concern that America will not be able to pay off its debts. So, so these are signs of the seven signs of recession. 
Now you were about to say, Rex? Yeah, and I, I'm glad I didn't inter interrupt and let you finish. There was just something that somebody brought to my attention here, and I'm doing three things at once while I'm listening to you. But did you hear about the Queen approving the suspension of Parliament? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's what I was talking about a moment ago. It was the, uh, yeah, she has the power to do that, and he can request that. It's pretty bold of uh, Prime Minister Johnson that he, uh, that he did that. Oh, there you go. Uh -oh. That happened on its own. We're still here. Yeah, the, the okay. mobile command center is still here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're about to be abducted. <laughs> yeah. Watch it's 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 Washington happening. State now. This is UFO woo-woo land. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry I brought it up in the way that I did. I thought you said something about that, and I just wanted to confirm it, because that is wild, man. It, it's rare, but it is within her purview. You know, the queen does have a couple powers remaining. And that is that she can she can disband she can approve or disapprove uh, a prime minister or a government being sent in, and if requested, she can do this. Uh, if, if Parliament is uh, not is not going to be convening until the prime minister is ready for them, now they say it's a dodge. Well, yeah, it is. It's a, it's actually a kind of a brilliant maneuver uh, that uh, there are. In an odd way, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is actually listening to the will of the people who three years ago voted a majority, a sizable majority, to leave the European Union. And it was no qualifier of it being soft or hard. It was simply, we're out of here. The, it's not being reported much by a lot of the mainstream um, news outlets in England and America, because they have always been pro Brexit, staying a pro staying in the European Union, but the people have spoken, and their Parliament, which is supposed to represent them, should now get out. And it has been three years that they've tried to pussyfoot around this and find a way not to get out. And Johnson has set up a, a very bold move because it it could be the end of him. It, that that uh, he's not giving them enough time to think more about, you know, at waste any more time of the British people with more than the three years of thinking about what they're going to do to stay in when the people say we want out, the majority. So you won't see that because the majority of the people in London are pro staying in the European Union. But if you get outside of London, a whole lot of people don't want to be there. So uh, it's a bold move. He's, he's, uh, I think people in England are saying, my goodness, at least this prime minister is trying to do something. You know, the last one um, is, is gone down in history as the worst prime minister in British modern history. Um, and so anyway, the, the significance, I write a lot about this because what he's about to do, and I'll just briefly add this to it, is he is about to be he could be, this is a prophecy joke, he could be, uh, not only is he the next United Kingdom Prime Minister, but he could be the first Prime Minister of England since the early 1700s, if he survives that long, because this move to get out of the European Union is going to bring another referendum from Scotland, who doesn't want to be out of the European Union, it's going to see probably Northern Ireland unite with the main, the, main, the rest of Ireland as one nation. So you're going to see, enjoy that Union Jack as it flies, because the, the flag may in a few years time go back to the white flag with the red cross of St. George, I think it is. Uh, and, and the old, and England will really go full circle in these last three centuries or so back from being the United Kingdom to the disunited kingdom and just England. So what, what is going on in there? We have just finished a retrograde uh, in July. It started in the beginning of July. It went backwards, Mercury, that is the ruler of mind decisions and in a political astrological context, decisions that that executives make, because it's a uh, it was um, in the American chart, 
when this country was born, Mercury was in cancer. That's a cardinal sign. That means executive decisions. It was opposed Pluto. Pluto uh, is literally the, the catalyst for the birth of the United States. The last time it was in Capricorn in its final degrees was when we gave birth to this nation through the Declaration of Independence. Now we've come full to a, a, a great US cycle, you could say, where it's been now for a number of years transiting Capricorn once again. And in the time that it's been doing it, a lot of the things that started our nation are now systemically being put in crisis. It's like a midlife crisis for the United States. I mean, back then in, in, uh, in 1776, that was when um, aristocracies in the world had reached their pinnacle. So that's in the other cycle. It's a cycle of aristocracies. That's when the aristocracies, now they all, all weren't united around the world. They were always often fighting each other around the world. But they, they were profiting from the emergence of the Industrial Revolution and the emergence of middle classes. That's the other cycle of the Pluto transit from Capricorn to Capricorn, which takes 250, roughly 250 years. So it's a, a big hunk of cyclic time in astrology, political astrology. What it means is that the, the place where one of the most powerful uh, aristocracies went to war against the newest middle class in the American colonies of Britain, it created the Revolutionary War. Um, the war was conceived and initiated in the end of the Capricorn transit, but it was really fought during the transit of of Pluto through Aquarius. Now, that's an important point because we're going to do that again very soon by 2024. When Capricorn Pluto becomes Aquarius Pluto, you will see again what you saw back then, like things like the French Revolution, the, the, a, a century of revolutions will fall, triggered by that. It's where concept, which is Capricornian, becomes actualized in. Uh, and um, experimented with in Aquarius. So, so mind you the importance of the year 2024. 2024 is also uh, the end of, would be the end of the current president's second term in office if he's elected. It would also be the end of the Russian president's final term in office. So huge shift for Russia, huge shift for the United States. Um, it would also be the, uh, one of the last planets of all these huge, we spoke about this before uh, last month, all these huge uh, earth planets that are shaking things up in politics, society, economics, and the earth, and climate. Uh, it, it would be uh, one of the last to leave an earth sign and really start movement. The, the one that will remain till 2026, I believe, is Uranus in its fall in Taurus, which is the, the, the revolutionary Uranus is in the most dense and earthbound uh, sign, which is most comfortable, uncomfortable being in. So it, it, it tears down structures. It tears down the fiat economy. It tears down democracy as we know it. It, it, it tears down religions and, and identities with the past. And, and it upends suddenly and unexpectedly a lot of things that we have held dear and identified with for the last five, 6,000 years. Um, it's, we are entering the 2020s, a time of, of great destruction and great transformation. This is the time, and especially when we uh, move into, and I spoke of this before, that when Pluto moves into Aquarius, it'll be there for 20 years, and it will not go out until 2044. And the insight I got into that is, that is literally, because it's generational, you could call that either the extinction generation or the rebirth of humanity generation. It depends on how, 
we uh, we act in what's coming. So the things that tr are moving this engine of upheaval started happening during this retrograde, especially for decisions that would be made at the end of the retrograde, which was around August 2nd. And those final few days of July into August 2nd was the time when transiting Mercury in retrograde passed over its natal position in the United States chart of 1776, which had that opposition with Capricorn, uh, Pluto in Capricorn. So it's how we think collectively as Americans is put on trial, is magnified. It's like, as a nation, where are we going from here? From the le leaders to the people, where are, how will we govern ourselves? Decisions were made by the executive branch that um, uh, made the uh, trade war with China far worse. Um, and that is the Achilles heel of the current leader of the United States who uh, could very well, uh, now that there's a beginning potential of him losing the 2020 election. And what that might bring in is another um, extreme, a lot of things now are in, in extremis, in extremis. Um, and that could actually bring a, um, the other swing to the other extreme, you know, so, socialism, gotta have, it would just, we'll just be socialistic. The problem is that monopolistic capitalism is, is a form, is just a different form of tyranny that extreme socialism would be. The, the most radical thing that human beings need to learn in the coming decade is balance. That that is the balance of the tightrope walker. I've used this metaphor before, where if you're stepping on a tightrope, or in my case, as a, when I used to paint houses, because I'm a hefty guy, I was the anchor to my partner would go 40 feet up a ladder. And you, if you're looking at us from the outside, you'd think nothing was happening, that I'm just there holding the ladder. But every move he's making 40 feet up from me, I'm compensating with muscles and bones. I'm moving inside my body, constantly compensating for if he moves left, I hold right and vice versa. And in the way, and you're very like focused in the moment. Um, this is, this analogy has to happen for our, our, for, for our survival in all aspects of life, being here now, being right, neither this extreme or that. Um, and then, so, so not only has this decision triggered an extension of the trade war and perhaps made China decide, as I worried would happen, is that they'll they'll say, okay, we we'll, we will work, we will hold on and hunker down until 2024 and beyond, when there's no possibility of having this issue with the American leadership that the leadership will change. So they're already if they're already going into the long game. And it's running out. If, if decisions aren't made in October, this trade war is going to be rolling for a while. And it's, uh, it will be very interesting to see what it may do to the election. One thing is that many years ago, I said that, um, that Elizabeth Warren would run for president in 2020. And I'm thinking now that uh, if she were to actually go against a lot of the money handlers of the Democratic Party and do what she used to do best as a, as a watchdog for financial abuse, there are certain things that she could put in her campaign if she survives the uh, primary gauntlet. That if she does these things, if she talks about reforming the banks, she very well may win. Um, so, so that's a new development. I haven't said that before. I, what I had said up to this point is that she, with the whole Pocah Pocahontas thing, uh, that she kind of got herself trapped into a classic game where, her, where the president can kind of use your negative uh, aspects against you. 
and quite brilliantly, he does it. So um, this this is so that's so that's one thing that that's changing. I think she's learning from that, but we'll see. Uh, her greatest hurdle now is her own party. Uh, as I as I predicted, the the polls for Biden are beginning to plunge. And I, I, I contend as much as it's been set, stated by rather rigged polls that he's not going to very last very long in this long marathon race. He's one of the first notable people to go down. I wouldn't be surprised if he's not even running by the beginning of next year. So, so anyway, so those are the things about the decisions made in this retrograde. But an important thing I want to talk to you about also is that a retrograde is often at its most intense five days into it when forward motion of whatever uh, of your thinking and your goals kind of gets tripped. And then, then you're kind of forced, if you're sensitive to these forces, cosmic forces, you actually can use the, wherever, whatever um, Mercury is transiting through, you can actually use that to look at the issues of that aspect of your chart and reflect upon what you did with your love or with your emotions or with this or that, your business and all, if it's related to the eighth house and review the last four months of that's how many months it is between retrogrades and see what you learned from that. And then at the end of the retrograde, which usually lasts about three weeks, you can be ready to move forward, but you have to always move forward with awareness and care. Um, because what often happens when people are unaware of these forces on a collective level is they stumble. It's like a revolving door and everybody gets in the same revolving thing and they stumble and everybody falls down like it's Keystone Cops. Like it's a, a um, slapstick comedy. Everybody trips over everybody. And so tempers can be high. Decisions by leaders with Mercury in executive uh, signs, cardinal signs like cancer, the sign of the United States, um, can make very rash decisions. But they are not the only ones that do that. I mean, the other rash decision that happened right at the end of the retrograde on 2nd of August is that the United States officially killed the INF Treaty the treaty that was the second of three pillars that literally keep the world from runaway arms, uh, arms races with nuclear-tipped weapons. The first thing that was kicked out from under was back in 2002 by the president at that time. Unilaterally, the United States decided to get out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And that started an arms race. The Russians had to find a way to deal with that um, because basically America then started building ABM batteries all around Russia. And the whole idea is if you take away the mutually assured destruction of MAD, uh, if you fire on me, I fire on you and you're both annihilated so you, you don't shoot. But if somebody can shoot down your missiles or they believe they can shoot down your missiles, then they have the advantage of hitting you whenever they want and your missiles can't hit back. That's very destabilizing. That's what we did by getting out of the ABM treaty in 2002. By getting on August 2nd, at the end of this retrograde, by getting out of the INF treaty where medium intermediate range missiles up until the 1987, when Gorbachev and Reagan signed that into, into power, it was a huge step towards ending the last Cold War. And uh, it basically erased an entire grouping of missiles that can fire from 500 kilometers to 5,500 kilometers. They were like the Pershing missiles that were all over the European uh, countryside. Um, they all were broken up and so were the Russian versions. Well, now we're, we're America who last year said we don't want to be in, in it anymore. And now officially the treaty is dead on the 2nd of August has just taken us a great step towards a more destabilized threat of nuclear war and arms races. Now, there is some hope. And um, both presidents have voiced an interest in talking about 
doing a whole different intermediate range uh, treaty, but the, they want to have China in it. Now, China doesn't want to be involved in it because most of their missile defenses is intermediate range missiles. So, and, give, and that's the other thing that's a rash about this retrograde. We're not just escalating the trade war. The new head of the Pentagon has, has made it very clear that, that we are going to um, increase the military presence around China, build bases, bring more assets in. Um, we, that very day, August 2nd, uh, the Pentagon head was in Australia saying, yeah, I'd like to see intermediate range missiles that we're now building because the treaty is dead in Australia, pointed at China. Australian government said no, but the Philippine government may say yes. And if they say no, Taiwan will say yes. Now, uh, it is very likely that we could pull a Cuban Missile Crisis move where, you know, Cuba was 100 or so miles off the coast of Florida and there were Soviet missiles based there, which freaked out the United States. Well, if we are on the island of Taiwan, Formosa, and the Strait of Taiwan is only 100 miles, it's the same situation if we start moving our military assets and basing them right at the doorstep of mainland China. Now, that brings me to another issue. And that is in these, in these five days, I said that come out, these five dangerous days of forward moving mercury, Another rash decision by the United States is to color a new color revolution. Now, this has been going on in the 21st century and even 1990, where we color our revolutions. There was the blue, uh, there was the, um, no, there was the um, orange revolution that we, that this NSA, CIA finance in Ukraine. Um, there were other similar things happening in other areas, but this is a new twist on it. I call this new color revolution because the Hong Kong, we're talking about the trouble in Hong Kong, is not what the mainstream is painting it to be. It has not just been because of these extradition laws that the Chinese wanted, uh, the mainland Chinese wanted to use, because Hong Kong is a different government in the same China. When Hong Kong moved to become part of China after the end of the lease of the British colonialists in 1997, it was decided that Hong Kong could keep its autonomy, but it was also now part of China. Now, it will be in that until another uh, change happens in the mid 2040s, then it is part of China. But what has been happening in the meantime is a lot of what I call totalitarian stress tests, tests from Beijing, where they see just how far they can go to change rules in Hong Kong from its more kind of Western orientation. And there's been a, there was an umbrella uh, rebellion about that where all these kids came out in the monsoon with their umbrellas and they backed off. This extradition law that they wanted to pass through the Hong Kong state government has created hundreds of thousands of students going in the streets. Now, that, that seemed like a spontaneous movement until uh, it was clear that the leaders were caught uh, being uh, interviewed by the US embassy leaders and, and you know, US officials. That, that raised a red flag for me. The other flag that's been raised all across this uh, rebellion this summer in Hong Kong have been Union Jacks for the British colony and lots and lots of American flags, both of which are red, white, and blue. So I call this color revolution the red, white, and blue revolution. In my articles, I show how there's, there's been active work by the CIA, the State Department, and NSA to, to support uh, these the, the rebels in Hong Kong to do more than just table and destroy this extradition bill. But they've had, they keep coming with more and more demands that frankly are literally saying, we wanna be independent from China. 
And so this is being done not, this is another front in the trade war. Hong Kong is a great economic center of China. And this is another attempt to, to put pressure on the Chinese in this trade war as they are putting pressure in the South China Sea by basically declaring certain islands in the South China Sea, give them sov sovereignty over what all other nations consider as international waters. So, so in the end of this retrograde and at the beginning of it um, in August 2nd, there were the most violent and large scale protests. The whole thing heated up in Hong Kong and has been hot ever since. So now we're extending this, this rash decisions that have consequences that could even lead to this trade war becoming at any time a shooting war between the United States and China. So the next thing that's uh, happening is not directly involved by the United States um, in, it, in its leadership and their decisions during the retrograde, but is a, a decision equally rash made by Prime Minister Modi and his BJP Hindu fundamentalist party. Um, they have absorbed the part of Kashmir that they still hold on to. Um, that is Kashmir, the background of this is since 1947 when the India was partitioned into Pakistan and India. Um, the first of three major wars and hundreds of border clashes since, um, the, the uh, Pakistanis allowed uh, Kashmiri Islamic extremists to, to invade Kashmir, which was autonomous and hadn't decided which uh, state it wanted to be in, because that was an option of each state. Um, long story short, a third of Pakistan was taken and occupied until the line of control was created to stop the war. India occupied the other half, basically, and Ladakh. But Kashmir has always been its own autonomous nation being protected by India and with its government having the power to approve a lot of things except for defense and India's security. Modi has always promised since his first term that he would um, absorb that part of Kashmir as a actual state of India, which means any attacks by insurgents that have been going on since 1989. I was there in India, living in India when all that started. And it almost came to a major war blows in 1990 with the potential of nuclear weapons being used. So here I was, a survivor of the Cuban Missile Crisis, finding myself in a regional Cuban Missile Crisis potential nuclear war. It almost happened again when the Lok Sabda was shot up, the, the part, it would be like the Capitol building the Congress was shot up by uh, Islamic terrorists coming through Kashmir based in Pakistan. So there was almost a nuclear war then. But this is quite a bold move. This, this move has made unilaterally Kashmir a part of India. That means the plebiscite that was promised by the United Nations is dead, that people could vote which side they could be on. The stipulation of India was, we're not gonna let that happen. It was uh, convened in 48, they would do it, but they said, we're not gonna let that happen until all the Pakistanis get out of Kashmir, the part they took. And so that was an impossible situation. So, so what we have now is a situation uh, between two regional nuclear powers who together have each about 150 to 200 nuclear weapons of the magnitude of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, they have the missiles uh, and capability to launch on both countries. And if this, this might think, oh, well, you know, it's just in India, it's, uh, the rest of the world will be fine, and maybe there'll be something, even some people, even I've reasoned that maybe a small regional Armageddon might scare the, the Jesus out of everybody in the world and, and, not, and do things to disarm and not have a global Armageddon. But there's a problem with that idea. The uh, climate science and other scientists have been doing new calculations about what would happen if at least 100 cities were set on fire by nuclear weapons. Not only would the fallout be bad, but even in a small nuclear war, wherever it was launched, that is enough smoke and debris to be pumped into the stratosphere, if, if not to start a nuclear winter, could start 
but I've often called from reading some of the more lurid prophecies of Nostradamus, a nuclear autumn where it's not cold enough to cover the earth in clouds, but it will definitely affect your crops. It will definitely disrupt the grow, growing systems of the world. So you could have outside of the hundreds of millions of people that might die in, this, in the Asian subcontinent, you could have, a. it's estimated that a billion more people would die from famine across the world from just a little regional nuclear war. That's why it's so important to have all nations disarmed from these weapons of mass destruction. Um, it's a much more fragile world than we've even imagined as science becomes better to understand these things. So Modi made his campaign promise and now India and Pakistan have, are in a, a stage of like our arms race from INF by the way, INF is the, I told you about three pillars. There's still one pillar left before we're completely exposed to runaway, chaotic nuclear proliferation all around the world. And that's the new START, S-T-A-R-T treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. This is the treaty that reduces uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles all over the world. We, it's done really well since the end of the Cold War. It's taken us from 72,000 nuclear weapons, strategic weapons, down to around 16,000. So, but that's still enough to destroy the civilization in the world because back then we could destroy the world eight, nine, 800 to 1,000 times over. So we're getting closer to, to that being less, but now, now things will probably increase, warheads will increase because every sign is that America is not going to renew in, 19, in 2021, they're not going to renew the treaty. Russia wants to renew the treaty, but they're not going to renew it. So we may see by 2021 that final pillar of stability that keeps the world from runaway nuclear proliferation knocked away. Now, it's important that that happens in 2021 because 2021 is a, is a benchmark year. It is, uh, it is the year that I think that after the recession, we actually run into a fiat collapse, the, the collapse of, of money that's not based on any standard of value, but simply based on currencies, uh, kind of a always uh, standing off without anything to lose. You know, what we've done is we've taken away value in our currencies. When there was a limit to value, things that are precious and rare, like gold and silver, uh, give a feeling of you, you can't kind of go on and on and on printing money forever. You have to spend within your means. You have to save as much as invest. Uh, and the, since 1971, when we got out of the um, fiat economy, uh, the uh, gold standard, we have not actually had a value to our currencies. Now, a lot of countries are preparing to restore uh, some kind of precious metal or Bitcoin or other thing to this. This is, this is the things that are, that are set in motion from uh, this retrograde. Any comments? Can't hear you. There's Great. a lot of comments. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, where should we start? You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, first of all, man, I, I'm definitely concerned about the Hong Kong situation, and and one of the things let's let's talk about it. Yeah. The, the Hong Kong situation, first of all, I find it fascinating because I read an article just a couple days ago about how they had a 28 mile human chain protest right. that was going on around the entire. And folks, these aren't sunglasses. These actually block the, the blue light from the <clears throat> somebody says Rex is wearing sunglasses at night. They're not sunglasses. They're blocking the computer uh, blue screen. So the blue light. But anyway, so the I heard about this 28 mile human chain that was going on around Hong Kong and a multitude of airports and just uh, train stations, uh, train stations 
And I was like, this is wonderful because it's nonviolent, at least the way that it was projected. And I remember just a few days before that article came out, I was talking about how the Soviet Union had invaded some of the Baltic states and they did, they wouldn't let the people dance. And they were rolling, one day they were rolling in with their tanks and everybody just went outside. They went outside and they all started dancing. And I remember looking at the video footage of the, uh, the, the Russians, the military. They didn't know what to do. They were on the tanks. They're like, what do we do? And they turned around. And I was like, that was the coolest thing I ever saw. So maybe it would be neat to see something like that work in a sense versus it being really nasty out there. But uh, yeah, I thought, that was, I thought that was pretty cool. But definitely we got to keep, you know, if they want complete independence, will that will china allow that will will it yeah. end up with war oh, i don't know but then you got taiwan and and then i was talking to bob kudel the other day former marine and he doesn't see them going into taiwan because taiwan they got some they got some heavy weapons out there too that that isn't talked about so it's like this this tinder box this very delicate position and you know pakistan and india and kashmir this is the very fascinating times we live in um fukushima let's talk about fukushima for a minute so you know eight years later fukushima is still not contained and i will say this here on the west coast i was testing the radiation levels today and i obviously th this isn't going to matter too much but folks the radiation levels out here are extremely low and i back when 2011 happened that event my folks were telling me about how in westport they had some friends out there they even went out there to see their friends and it was like six months after the event they said the whole town smelled like ammonia or something like that and some of the debris was coming in from fukushima and a lot of people were saying hey this is an extinction level event extinction level event and i was saying look we're still here fish are still there look at all the crabs that are you know, wash it up on the seashore here. So let's let's be optimistic about it. But we also need to be very aware about it. And it doesn't matter what I think, because it goes back to the stars, man. And, you know, you really watch the stars and follow the stars and the quatrains, the Nostradamus stuff. And I find it fascinating because even if you read the Nagamati scriptures, they say that the angels can't change the decision of the stars in one of the scriptures. And I find that fascinating. So we live in amazing times, John. Watch the stars, study them. Yeah, the, the thing about Hong Kong, um, again, it, it's, I, I know I spent a lot of backstory, but it's important because a lot of people in our country are not taught the backstory. Uh, Hong Kong was literally a, when the, when the British in the 1840s demanded that the Chinese uh, smoke their opium, the Chinese didn't even want opium in the country, they had an opium war. And one of the reparations for losing the Opium War was China had to give over Hong Kong to the British so they could use those ports to ship in their opium. And, you know, a third of the people in China were addicts. And it basically destroyed what in the 1800s was the largest uh, economy in the world, China. And a lot of people don't know that, that it was uh, the biggest GDP of any country in the world was the Chinese. Well, they all became addicts like the opioid crisis is, is doing to a lot of Americans. And, and so there's a stigma of the fact that this is colonial behavior, racist behavior by white people against yellow people. Uh, and that there's uh, the view in China is there's some more white people in Washington that are now using these kids to to create enough of trouble for China that China which now has a lot of forces around Hong Kong may go in and shut it down like Tiananmen Square and so it'll make China the this is the cynical goal of the NSA and people like the head of the NSA and the State Department right now is uh, they're hoping the Chinese will go in and a lot of people will get killed so that China will be seen as an ogre and a monster. And, and whether it is or not, what you're not seeing is these people are manipulating the situation in Hong Kong. And a lot of these gullible kids don't know that they're strategic cannon fodder for that. Now, what's, uh, what I hope will happen is that what, what worked here, like with the Umbrella Revolution several years ago, is that they stopped 
Beijing from doing something. And then that was it. And then they went back to normalcy. But you can tell the manipulation in this uh, colored revolution because a lot like all the others, a, a one real grief, one real issue is being resolved. They come back with a half dozen more things they demand must happen. And a lot of those demands are opaque. They're not actually detailed. We want democracy. Well, heck, the, the Hong Kong Chinese citizens during all the years the British ruled it had no democracy. So that was for the white British people. So, so it's, it's a, erroneous to the situation. The other thing that's very important to understand is, imagine if Hawaii was taken over uh, by, um, I mean, was, uh, imagine like your friend who was looking how they'll never attack Taiwan. Well, there were a lot of people at the beginning of the Civil War who thought, would the Army of Northern Virginia in Virginia? Washington's never going to attack Virginia. See, this is, this is a Civil War issue. This was, the Taiwan was born out of the end of the Great Chinese Civil War, which had been raging since the 20s, 1920s, and came to a head right after World War II, which brought Mao and the Chinese mainland communists into power in October of 1949. Now, the, um, the Chiang Kai-shek and his uh, government and forces and the people that could get away from the mainland Chinese uh, takeover colonized Taiwan, which was a, a state. Literally, it would be like if all 50 states, uh, you lost all but one state and you kept that state. Now, if often the Chinese will cite Abraham Lincoln, when they talked to American leaders about Taiwan, I said, you're telling us you're even arming, you know, the British were helping the Confederacy. Uh, they, were, they were bringing in arms and all of that. Britain and the United States under Lincoln almost went to war. When Lincoln seized a British vessel and took the vice president of the, the, uh, the chief negotiator to the British who was trying to get him in the war, took him off the boat. Um, the British responded and they were the powerful empire that time, we'll go to war with you. And so Lincoln apologized, gave the guy back and famously said, one war at a time, please. <laughs> Had a great sense of humor. And um, so, so the Chinese see that as North Virginia, Florida, Alabama, the union broken. And they are ready, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, this might be a pretty bloody war with the South that they fought it. The North fought the South. You've got to think about it in those terms. The mainlanders will go into Hong Kong. They will go into Taiwan. This is the dangerous miscalculation that could happen if, if certain leaders in, in powerful places in Washington think that the Chinese won't, if, if, if America starts to put major forces there, they will take them out. Um, so it, it just if Britain had done the same thing, Lincoln would have sent a Union army against a, a landing of British troops again. So, and when you consider the issues of all the suffering and pain that colonial powers did to the Chinese people, we aren't even aware of it. They've never forgotten it. So the other danger too is that, uh, to be fair, is that there's been two generations now since Tiananmen Square massacre of all these students in this huge square in Beijing. We we're just trying to get reforms. It was actually quite, for the most part, nonviolent. But at a certain point, the Chinese army was brought in and thousands of students were killed. And what then happened is that the... Um, since then, the Chinese education system, mainland China has not talked about it. So a lot of the mainland Chinese don't know what to expect either from what could have happened if there is an, in, uh, an occupation to restore order in Hong Kong. Um, so it, there's a lot of uh, blind spots on both sides of these things. So, but I wanna kind of change the focus I want to want to look at some other things that happened in these last two months of 
some are that are very interesting and um, and re and they are related in regards to things I'm kind of prompting up these very articles I'm talking about articles that by the way I I can send you uh, for a donation of five dollars at Hope Prophecy you can get the complete articles fully illustrated uh, beautifully designed and the thing is that there we go The first thing that intrigues me is that I wanted to kind of share with you, I don't often get a chance to do this, but actually share with you some of the amazing prophecies of Nostradamus. And um, there's two in, in particular that relate to what happened in July 50 years ago when we had the triumph of landing a man on the moon with Apollo 11. And uh, there has always been a question whether Nostradamus had seen such a major historic affair because he often seemed to see these things. And he saw it and something more. He saw, and he has these two verses that, that hold the same word bridges that are about the same thing. Our greatest triumph and tragedy in space were foreseen by him. So in the, the ninth volume of his prophecies, Century Nine, or hundred verses, four line verses called, called quatrains. And interestingly enough, the quatrain number is quatrain 65, kind of close to 69. There are some times where it seems like he's trying to date these prophecies with the indexing. Now he made these indexings to his prophecies because I think he had foresight into knowing that a lot of people would make fake ones. But if you see a prophecy of Nostradamus without its quatrain century number, uh, it's probably fake. Because if you had the century quatrain number, you could, uh, you could associate it directly to the real prophecy and see whether it was bogus or not. So always be mindful of that when you're seeing tons of amateur experts on internet uh, playing around with Nostradamus's prophecies. So the prophecy says, he will come to take himself to the corner of the moon where he will be taken and placed on alien land. So that's about the moon landing. But the second two lines is about the tragedy of the Challenger disaster. He says, and he'll do this. He'll cut right out of one theme into another, right in the middle of a verse. He says, the unripe fruit will be the source of great scandal, great blame to the other great praise. So something unripe, you got to remember that this is a man who used seed pods and fruit and other kinds of metaphors of a pre-industrial, pre-space era prophet from the 16th century, mid-1600s, uh, 1500s, sorry, um, that... Uh, Unripe fruit is like some something something that like they're in a pod, they're being taken up, but it's unripe, it's not ready, um, and it'll be a source of great scandal. Hold that thought because the next verse I'm going to talk to you will continue it, this mystery. And great blame to one side, great praise to the other. You got to remember that when Shuttle Challenger was blew up after a few uh, a few dozen seconds of liftoff when they started, started up the solid boosters. Um, that put the United States out of space for several years and Mir and the Soviet, or yeah, the Soviet space uh, program was actually doing pretty well. So one side is praise, the other side, great scandal. So the next verse, and this is all out of sequence because he made a point of taking everything out of sequence so people couldn't figure stuff out. People like Hitler, people like Saddam Hussein, people that Hitler, in fact, and, and his propaganda minister was actually trying to use Nostradamus's prophecies uh, to as propaganda. But uh, a lot of the Gestapo Nostradamians that were working with him, like Karl Ernst Kraft, were sincere scholars, even though I don't agree with their politics. They were sincere scholars trying to see how Hitler, who is called Hister in the prophecies, the man of the crooked cross, swastika, Hachenkreuz, that's what it means in German, crooked cross, 
um, would win. The captain of Greater Germany that Nostradamus called him. Greater Germany was the name. The Gross Deutsches Reich was the official name of the Third Reich, Greater Germany. Um, uh, and he talked about alliances that were broken in the years 41 and 45, 1941, 1945, when the Soviet Union was invaded by Hitler, which was the most significant mistake he ever made. It ended his chances of winning the world in World War II. It happened in 1941, and it was when he broke the German-Russian non-aggression pact. The, uh, the pact of the uh, Axis Alliance, was destroyed in 1945 with the end of the war, 45. In fact, when he talks about the great invasion in the forest, through the forest of the Ardennes, which he actually names outright, the Ardennes forest is where in 1940, France fell to Nazi panzers. But he says two empires will fall through the Ardennes. Hitler's empire fell in 44, 45 in the Battle of the Bulge, where he tried to do the same thing and lost. The number of the quatrain is century five, quatrain 45. Five stands for the month of May, 1945. Now, we go to another interesting prophecy that is century one. This is part two of the triumph tragedy of our space uh, history in America. Century one, quatrain 81, uh, starts, nine will be set apart from the human flock, separated from judgment and counsel, their fate to be determined on departure. Kappa, that's the letter K in Greek. Theta, TH in Greek. Lambda, L in Greek. Dead, banished, and scattered. Just like if you saw when, when, when it exploded in space, 70 some seconds after liftoff, the unripe fruit of the solid rocket booster, which was already showing signs of flaming in some of the footage. When it was blown, it was broken up, scattered into bits. This, he's seeing this. And here's the thing that is so rare in Nostradamian study. In fact, I'm writing, I'm putting a lot of my articles about lessons in Nostradamus that are eventually going to become a book where I'm gonna to try to use my 40 years of working in this field to bring more scholarly capability back into it because Nostradamus has never been more famous, but he's never been more misrepresented than he is now in the era of internet where any, anybody becomes an instant Nostradamus scholar, not knowing the 16th century French, not knowing how he played anagrams and word games, not knowing what Nostradamus knew. And if you don't know what Nostradamus knew, and if you don't know and understand the world that he lived in, its prejudices, its hopes, its fears, if you don't understand that, you can't reconstruct the way he filtered what he saw and wrote about. You will then follow the conceit of your 21st century thinking and filter it through your 20th first century mind, and you'll be wrong. And what you'll do sometimes, in fact, I'm finishing my 49th book called um, Nostradamus and the Notre Dame Fire, the authentic prophecy. And I, I was so shocked at the level of idiotic stuff that was published by some major figures out there, astrologer, an astrologer in England that was really the source. And, and this astrologer literally could not see the astrological prediction right in front of her face. And she whitewashed with her projection of ignorance what was one of Nostradamus's greatest prophecies that wasn't about Notre Dame at all, but it's definitely about whether you have a future or not. And it's dated. So the first chapter in that book is, is playfully but assertively showing, taking you through a journey to, un to unravel all this amateurishness and actually see what that head of Aries, the long century prophecy was really about, one of his most famous prophecies. But, um, and then we look at the, the cathedral fires where he used lady or dumb, dame, just like in the musical, there's nothing like a dame, nothing in the world. 
You know, it used to be an archaic way that men used to address women. Hey, there's some great dames over there in the 1940s. Uh, so he uses, it's from the old French, dame. Uh, and, and so he uses it. And what I do in the book is show you all the times, 26 quatrains and prophecies where he uses the term to see when he's talking about a woman or a cathedral. And I have found the prophecy about that situation. And this book will be out in a week or so uh, where we'll look at this. But that's a sidetrack. I want to get back to quatrain 81 of century one. Again, here's it's 81. It's interesting. It's just five years off from 86, early January 86, when it took place, the explosion of the challenger. So nine will be set apart from the human flock. Now he's wrong here. It was seven. The crew of the, of the challenger had seven people. But things change. Uh, Nine will be set apart from the human flock. He never uses that terminology until he does it in here. So it's literally, okay, they're out there. They're going into space. As separated from judgment and counsel, there were a number of people, people from the Morton Fire Call Company and others who were saying, and I know this firsthand because my best high school friend father, his father, was the man who made the shuttle um, heat shields work. So he was a major figure in NASA. And he, after he did that work to make the shield, the, 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 um, the tiles work, uh, he retired early. And he told me why. He said, I saw how, where this is all going, and I don't want to be on watch when one of these things blow up because they're cutting corners. They're no longer doing the redundancies at NASA. They are cutting corners, and I am so afraid that some of these good astronauts are going to be killed. I don't want to be responsible for that. So he took early retirement. And... I went to see him after the shuttle disaster. And I said, Robert, Robert Heisman, you were right. You were right about that. And he said, yeah, I wish I wasn't. But uh, basically, so separated from judgment and counsel. So they're not being listened to. There, even that morning, there was icicles, a rare Florida morning when there was icicles all over the gantry and the rocket boosters. Now, they could have waited another day when it was a little warmer, it is subtropical in Florida. It's rather rare to have ice, but they said, no, no, we got to stay on schedule. It's all about schedule. Kind of sounds like Boeing with these jets. Oh, we lost 148 people. No, keep it on schedule. Oh, we lost 360 people. Oh, and now you've got this situation. It's the same kind of mindset, forgetting the people. So um, their fate to be determined on departure well, it was within 73 seconds that the throttle up was asked from uh, command center. And he says, going with throttle up. And you hear the first part of the explosion in the headset of the man before he was obliterated. You hear the man, nothing. So the last line looks like gobbledygook for those who are not initiated in this long study. But when you know what I know about this use of K, T, H, and L in their Greek, it's an anagram. It's what I call a consonant anagram. It's like NBS. A lot of people use MBS in our time to talk about Muhammad bin Salman. It is a, it is a thing that Nostradamus does is that he'll put the consonants up and you got to fill the missing vowels. In the case of MBS, it's a U and an A. M A B U S. His name for Mabus the third and final Antichrist, Napoleon, Napoleon Roi, Napoleon King, and Hister being the first and the second. So it's very likely that the prince of Saudi Arabia, who is the, the king behind the king, is actually, is certainly the best candidate I've seen in 30 years of being on the trail of the Antichrist. So with that aside, when I look at THL and K, what I'm seeing is a classic middle switch anagram where the TH is in the middle, it should be in the front. So TH, K, L, what are the missing vowels? The missing vowels 
are the I's and the two O's of Thiokol. Morton Thiokol, the second of the two names of the people who built the rocket booster that blew up because of the O-rings that didn't work, that didn't seal properly, that weren't in, and might have even been the cold, banished from, from council. You know, the, and then, you know, it, it, then the banished and scattered, you know, Thiokol went out of business because of this. And, and the banishing is a double entendre for the, the dead people being blown up into pieces and falling out of the sky. So, so that's how deep it can go in these verses. How much time do we have left? Well, I mean, we could do a 24-hour live stream if you want to, man. I'm cool with that. We've been going on an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. And if you want to go on like maybe another 45 minutes or so, that okay. sounds good. If we need to go a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, that's fine. And I want to say thanks, True, for the live uh, super chat there. Um, yeah, man, this is fantastic. Now, a moment ago when you stopped, I literally, because I'm on the beach here, right? Hold on a second. Let me add something cool to this. I want to... I'm wearing these these glasses and it makes it look even cooler when I've got these things on. Yeah. You see the flex and these eyeballs here. It's like, man. So I'm on the beat. <laughs> and when I, I jumped out for a second, because you were talking, I jumped out for a second just to make sure that the surf, the tide wasn't getting so close that I was. So if that happens again, just keep going, man. We're good. I was like, okay, I'll be right back. I open. It's funny, folks. I opened up the door. I jumped out. And John's talking. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll make it back in time. But man, I didn't quite make it back in time. Yeah, well, I was figuring. I was just figuring. Uh, yeah, I was just figuring uh, that you were kind of yeah you know, monitoring everything. I didn't think about the surf, but you know, I thought maybe it's because of all the the power stuff, the issues, the lights coming on, the lights going off, and you, you always just wanted to make sure. But man, I love those glasses in this uh, the glow of this computer. It really makes you. If we painted you gray, you would be walking right out of a Whitley Strieber uh, book. <laughs> someone just said I look like it. Someone said, "Who's the mime next to John?" I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, who's the mime next to John? Uh, he's noise is coming out of that screen now, folks. Seriously, these aren't sunglasses. These block the the blue light from the computer, which the blue light is actually it's not good for for eyesight, especially if you're looking at it for long periods of time. So that's why I've got these going on. But I've also got Thoth here on the uh, on the chest. So you know, got Thoth protecting me. This is actually my friend Brady Shally painted this, and then I've got the original, and I've got shirts. That are pretty cool. You, I don't know if you can see yeah. that. Yeah. Right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's nice. Yeah, she did good. So John, you're you're on it, man. I mean, you're you're really hitting on all cylinders here. So I'm just letting you flow because I've noticed when we do podcasts sometimes you get so deep in the zone that you can go on. And if I interject, it just kind of takes away from the presentation. So I think sometimes the best interviewer is one that just listens and let things go and jumps in at the right time. And you're, you're really on it. So I, I also, folks, I want to let you know if you go to HogueProphecy.com, HogueProphecy.com, if this is your first time being here. I know we've got a lot of new listeners. We've got almost a 1,000 people watching the live stream right now, which is good to see. Um, go to HogueProphecy.com. And John also does readings, personal readings with people. He does astrological charts, et cetera, very detailed. And also, I hope to see everybody here at Yelm coming up in a few days. It's going to be, actually, we're just a couple days away, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the Yelm UFO Symposium. Click the link, go to the Yelm UFO Symposium. If you use the code LP, you'll get a discount on tickets. There's going to be a bunch of great speakers, vendors, food. There's all sorts of stuff that's going to be there that's going to be fun. And also, I want to let you know, too, that if you click that link that I was telling you about earlier, the thing about Bitcoin and Litecoin and cryptos is they can be scary. I mean, if you don't know what you're getting into, you can you can be very successful. You can also lose your shorts really quick. So if you know what you're doing and you've got the right people behind you, that's why I say click the links at the Noble Gold Investments, also Noble Gold Bitcoin. They'll kind of walk you through it if you're interested. And hey, if not, that's cool too. Keep doing what you're doing. Just remember what happened back in 2007. Hopefully you were able to get out of that opportunity. Did, did you have friends back in 2007 that we're kind of, did you see the writing on the wall? Because I did. I was working for a Fortune 100 company, and I was watching the stocks all across the board just continuing to plummet. And then I was talking to a friend of mine that worked for the DOD before he started working for this Fortune 100 company. He said, Rex, get ready. This place is going to start laying off employees. They're going to start shutting down stores. And sure enough, just like clockwork, they did that just a few months after. Now, they've rebounded, and they've been very successful. But there was that time there that it got really gnarly. Yeah, I 
I was um, I was talking about all through 2007, especially then there was, I mean, I watch MSNBC mostly just to see, okay, what's the propaganda spin? What's the, oh, don't worry, everything's fine. There's no recession. You know, they're a little, they're a little gun shy, more gun shy now. MSNBC and CNBC are, oh, well, CNBC especially is, is now having to actually report the fact that things are looking like recession. That's a change because, uh, and that's kind of, that's kind of eerie too, because um, that shows that even they're a little panicked not to put on the happy face and drink the Kool-Aid and have, try to sell you the Kool-Aid. Um, so uh, yeah, I, in my predictions for 2008, uh, which came out in January, I talked about how the crash would happen in September and autumn, the big crash. And I, I tend, you know, I, I know I come, I, I'm the mailman. I get the messages and I send them and write them or talk about them. So the, if you ask the mailman how this economy works, I can't tell you. I mean, people often say, John, will you make a prediction for me? Or when I do readings, where the same kind of energy that I'm giving all of you tonight is the kind of care and totality, the zone, that looks into your future. And so if you go to hogueprophecy.com, that's H-O-G-U-E-P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y.com, right at the top of the page, you'll see uh, Hogue readings in red. And uh, there's a, an email address there. You click on that address. All you have to do is just put in the uh, subtitle Hogue Readings. And, and I will then engage you and give you the overview of what I do uh, with the uh, divination of the Osho Zen Tarot deck as well as with astrology. And also what I do uh, with the, um, you know, how you, how you pay for it and how we set up the online meeting on Zoom and all of that. So just just uh, go to hogueprophecy.com. Uh, it's uh, summer's over. The reading season is beginning. <laughs> and when you get off the beach, it's time for reading. <laughs> so <laughs> if you feel to. So anyway, continuing this situation, we just looked at what happened 50 years ago uh, for us but something that was actually seen in the 1550s by Nostradamus, the moon landing. Now we're in uh, ending August, and this August has already seen the 74th anniversary, 74 Augusts ago in the year 1945 in a spin around the sun, uh, we had the first nuclear war. It's usually not considered that, People still expecting it in the future, but actually we've already fought a nuclear war. It was very one-sided because only one side had nuclear weapons. And that one side, when they had nearly defeated and ruined and left their enemy prostate on, on the ground, they destroyed the last two cities standing. And it was not done to impress the Japanese as much as it was done to impress the head of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, the dictator of communist Russia. It was Harry Truman's attempt to reveal to Stalin the power of the United States because already the alliance that had defeated Hitler in May of 45 was already beginning to show signs of strain. Now, the one of the things, before I get into these amazing prophecies of Nostradamus, this prophecy about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki blast, um, something that I introduce into my work, and I haven't done this much on radio, so this will be a first for most of you on Rex. I always try to do firsts on Rex's show, because he's been so great to have me on and allow me to actually take the time to give you the flow. There you go. Da, 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 da. There you are. And, and, and so... The thing, a lot of the themes I go into is how the future will redefine how we look at the past, how a more enlightened society will look at our history books and see where our emphasis was wrong because they will not be guided by politics and competition and, and uh, they will not 
have much respect for the heroically insane people that we dominate and crowd our histories with, the politicians, the Hitlers, the Nader Shahs, the, the Maos, and, and all these. They will look at people that were ignored or shunned even, burned at the stake even by the society. The scientists, the Einsteins, the mystics like Buddha, the others, they will look at the dancers. They will look at the singers, the people who made music, the people who made love. They will, they will look at things that are gloriously human about us, that make the world more beautiful, more aesthetic, more silent. But they will also look at our, the side of our history, which was against all that, and perhaps understand why that it was uh, the ego identity that was fueling our history. So when they do this, they will, um, <laughs> when they do this, uh, the one thing that I predict they're going to do is they're going to change the view that we have here in this country about that most of us have been taught, but it's actually, I contend in the future, be proven false, that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki saved lives, that it hastened the end of the war, that it was the reason the Japanese surrendered. It wasn't. You probably don't know this, but the Japanese, even before the fall of Berlin in May of 1945, in April of 1945, back channels of the Japanese government were trying to talk to the Secretary of State in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's American government to find a way to surrender, to end the war. So we're talking months before the war ended, the Japanese were ready to surrender. They just had one condition. And frankly, I think a rather minor one because of their culture, the concept was, look, we will, everything's unconditional. You can occupy our country, dismantle all our guns, you can change this even, but do not take the emperor of Japan off his throne. He's a figurehead of our society. In fact, you know, Emperor Hirohito is not that involved in the war. That was the Japanese government. He was, he, when he would be asked anything, he would recite a poem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they had to figure it out. It was, it was Hideki Tojo and uh, the head, the prime minister, military prime minister of Japan, the militarist government that took over um, when peace could not happen in 41 with the Americans. Uh, it, was, it was a militarist government around the emperor. So here's why, this is what happened. Isn't it strange that the last two cities standing that had the least amount of damage from the firebombing that happened throughout 1944 into 45, that leveled Tokyo and all the major cities and a lot of the medium-sized cities, but everything was devastated. And of course, America was planning in October for Operation Typhoon or something, I think it was called. They were going to go on a land invasion of the home island. But here's what happened that really shocked people to end the war. And you'll never hear about it because it happened on the day Nagasaki was bombed. Now, August 6, 1945, the first city to go down to show off to Stalin the power of the United States was Hiroshima. The second bombing, that was on the 6th. Three days later on the 9th, Nagasaki was hit. There was nobody in Japan that even knew these were atomic weapons for days. They just thought it was a bad firebombing. And then when they learned of it, a lot of the leaders in Japan were saying, well, if it's one bomb or a thousand bombs, you've wiped all our cities out anyway. What's well, the difference? But what really shocked not only the Japanese and the American government is that when Truman had asked Stalin if he could possibly move troops in and invade Manchuria or get in the war to help hasten the end of the war, he had no idea that within three months, Stalin would pull up uh, 1.5 million men, 7,000 planes, 
50,000, 40, let's see, 5,500 tanks, 23,000 heavy pieces of artillery and invade all along the northern edges of Manchuria, taking out an army of 900,000 Japanese, most of them captured within a few days. I mean, the power of the Soviet land armies was immense and, was, and even the Americans had not calculated this. The, the fighting was so swift that the Russians were ready to land on the northern island, home island of Hokkaido. And so the Japanese then were faced not with the atomic bomb as the problem. And this is in the record, if you don't listen to the propaganda, but actually have a full investigation. Of this. The Japanese diet was looking at the government, was saying, okay, we have a choice between two devils. The devil we know, the Americans, who have a lot of our West, our, our values, or the communists. We are going to end up like Germany, divided into a communist Japan and a non-communist Japan. It'll be the ruination of our society, what's left of it. So they were ready to sign on that. But to because the Americans were so afraid of what the Russians were doing, they agreed to the emperor staying on his throne, my friends. It had nothing to do with the 150,000 people who were incinerated or later died of radioactive diseases and plagues. That was not what ended the war. It was the Soviet invasion of Manchuria that shocked both sides, Americans and Japanese, to expedite and make compromises for the so-called unconditional surrender. So that's what the future is going to see. It's already happening now. The evidence is there. The people of the future will know that this was America trying to sugarcoat a crime against humanity, a crime that only the victors get away with. And I mean, it's like the crime of in the Bible, the crime of the Hebrews. The Hebrews wiped out three entire races. Don't believe me, read Sam, book of Samuel 1 and 2, Deuteronomy, look at Exodus, look at this, you will find that the Moabites, the Canaanites, and the Amalekites were completely annihilated by the Hebrews when, they, when God had said this was their promised land, and the man who said it got out of Dodge as fast as possible, Moses. The, so... You know, and, and you know, it's, it, I'm not being hard on the Hebrews because Americans have also been very successful in nearly eradicating entire races, the Native American peoples. So, so we, all nations do crimes against humanity. The nations who win get to sugarcoat their crimes. The people of the future will not be living in national identities. They will be living as one human race with its many colors and its many riches. And they will, because of that, they will see through our masks of American, Russian, Japanese, Jew, Muslim, all our religions. They, they will not live in those identities and they will not suffer the consequences of living in that division and identity of identity. They will live as individuals alone together and they will see our history in a different way than we see it now. And one of the things that happened, one man saw our history. He saw our history in 1555. And in century two, quatrain six, he wrote, near the harbors within two cities, there will happen two scourges, the likes of which was never before seen, famine, a pestilence from within, people put out by the sword, cries for help to the great immortal God. I mean, this is one of those rare moments where Nostradamus is getting emotional about what he's seeing. And my God, what was he seeing? He was seeing, uh, here's the thing. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were both ports, both harbors, harbor cities. The two scourges never before seen, well, no one before that moment in August of 1945 had ever seen the atomic bomb level two cities. So this is, uh, so this is, I believe, even though he's not mentioning directly uh, Japan, 
this, I think, is mostly about it. And then the other thing, too, is a strange riddle. Uh, this is the doctor who fought pestilences in the 16th century in France. So he had a he had a a lot of experience about sickness as a doctor, but he calls this pestilence a pestilence within. Are you aware that that radioactive sickness begins to unravel the cellular center of your your physical matter? So it literally burns from within and radiates out. I mean, there was the man the first man that actually had a serious study as he was dying of radiation disease was one of the men in the Manhattan Project in Los, Alamogor in Los Alamos who uh, had an accident when he was moving some highly radioactive material. The lid, the lead lid moved and he had to reach out and put it back on. Otherwise, everybody, everybody in, the, in the building would have been killed by the, it was high radiation. And at that point, even it must have been really bad because they didn't really understand how bad radiation could be. But his first reaction when he did that and saved everybody is, oh, my God, I'm dead, he said. And what happened then is the arm that had touched the radioactivity, it swelled up into three times its size from inside. And it's like the doctors were working on him, and it seemed like his organs and everything were swelling up. Uh, from this really heavy jolt of radiation. And they're like going, God, we, I don't know how to fix him. I don't know how to help him. Uh, it's like, we've never seen this kind of a disease before coming from within, you know, from, and, and here's Nostradamus describing something very similar, the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so, and, you know, he's using the, po the poetic term of, you know, the, the put out by the sword. I get the feeling that this is like when people are in 16th century are thrown out of their cities and towns, grabbing their children, they're out in the woolies because, you know, the world was a lot less populated then. Uh, there, there wasn't another big city to go to. The Paris, capital of France in the 1550s, was the second largest city in the world and it only had 160,000 people. It has 10 million now. And the bigger city was London with a quarter million, 250,000. Those were the two largest cities in Europe at the time. So we were talking about a world, there were 14 million people in France at that time. Now, now there's, you know, almost 70 million. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that we don't understand in our crowded world. So when you're cast out of the, uh, of the town beyond its walls, put to the sword, um, it makes me think of all the pictures of the of the children and the women with their hair burnt straight up, with the, no clothing left, only the pattern of kimonos burnt into their flesh, and you know they're walking like Frankenstein's monsters with with large parts of the skin hanging from their burnt arms. Um, this is a scourge. And I, I, when I was writing this and updating this for my, in the next couple of years, I'm going to completely revamp my 1997 complete examination of all of Nostradamus's prophecies into 750 page volumes. And it's, uh, I, I cried when I was looking at this. I, I was like, I was there with him. It was like, it was like, how did this man, how did this man see these things and, and keep centered. How, how was he able to see such things? And of course, you know, the sad thing about it is, is, is most of his prophecies are very pessimistic, but there are some that are not. But um, I mean, he saw a lot of potential bad stuff. Uh, he also saw some immense wonders like humanity leaving the world and colonizing different constellations. So, in lieu of that, just one last thing I will say, the, the quatrain is quatrain six. Um, the, the, attack, the attack on Hiroshima was on August 6th. Now, another anagram number word game. If you can turn a number upside down and make a new number, you can do it. 
You turn the six into a nine. Nagasaki was bombed on August 9th, 1945. So, you know, sometimes the volume, Century 2, works, sometimes not. Um, the thing that caught even some really fine scholars of Nostradamus in a trap is that the patterns in Nostradamus are random. There's not one pattern or one key to unlock the whole thing. There was one one man that I respect who, who went into the human, human, humongous effort of translating everything of Nostradamus under the theory that all the quatrain indexes were dates. Dozens of them are, I would contend, but you, you get trapped into actually you have to project something to make that so, and he couldn't catch himself. And the poor man wrote Mario reading. He wrote, in my view, you know, I like Mario's work, but it was a classic example of even the best among us getting caught in a, in a trick of, of our own projections on the cloudy verses of Nostradamus that one man writes an entire thousand page book on this cloud being a giraffe. And another man over here writes one on it being a bunny. <laughs> but the thing I've tried to do is simply look at the cloud as a cloud and not put myself project myself and its images of my mind onto Nostradamus. And that takes decades of learning to be able to accomplish. So, but in, in the same breath, I've got to say that it, 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 one always has to be mindful of the potential of conditioning and projection, even with me. So, so the thing um, I want to go to from this now is my last, uh, and this is a kind of a real nice mind blower to end on a really beautiful note, is um, as far back as my sophomore year, I was planning a book about the future because of the things that were happening to me. And especially when I was 21 years old, I had this uh, thing happen where I, uh, I was doing a lot of astro, uh, Robert Monroe astro projection. Uh, I was in his gateway program, 50,000 guinea pigs. And we were all making our reports about, about this marvelous work. One of the real pioneers of, of subjective scientific research into the subject, the scientist. How do we take who watch the things we invent and discover? And astral travel being a psychic possibility, we did it. So. I was doing that and I was uh, uh, I was doing Zen breathing meditations and I got incredibly heavy. I felt very tired, so tired I didn't even take my shoes off. I collapsed, fainted in my bed. I'm 21 years old. Now at a certain point I become aware as I'm laying there that I can see I've got my tennis shoes on in the bed. It's like, oh, that's not nice. That's dirty. I, I, I really did. And so what I do is I lift up and go, yeah. And then I go back into the position of sleeping. But what I became noticeable of was that I was not, the body wasn't moving with me. My consciousness was making this move, but the body was laying on its side in the bed asleep. I went, oh, I'm out. I'm fully conscious and out of my body. So then what happened is my body started, I, my consciousness was like an, a bundle of awareness that kind of floated to the top of the ceiling. And my body looked far, far away, like everything was getting elongated. And all around me, I heard the sound of falling waterfalls of sound that were infinite numbers of voices talking, babbling, talking, like all the voices, all like I was surrounded by an invisible line of waterfalls of human voices. And then, and then I began to expand spherically. I call it the spherical sight, for want of a better word, to describe something that really goes beyond dialectical understanding. But what then happened was, imagine, if you will, a, that your eyes, which are single pointed in one direction, is actually, you could see on a surface of a sphere, everything that was around in all geometric possibilities. As you're expanding, you're seeing, you're seeing like a whole 
you're in the middle of something and you don't have eyes in the back of your head. You have seeing in the back of your, and in the front, and in the above, and in the below. And it's kind of got a quality of sphericalness. It expands and it expands and whatever it touches as it grows bigger and bigger into other worlds and other things, you become a part of it. And then there comes a point where you're surrounded by a vast, I at least, I'm speaking for myself, everybody has their own experience, a vast spherical library of infinite gateways into actions past, present, and future happening all simultaneously. And it's like all the knowledge. This, I, I finally came to think that this is perhaps what they meant by the Akashic record. Some place of, of a very high plane where, where perception of linear time and space disappears and all things are happening and meeting and annihilating each other and rebirthing each other all at the same time. And in this kind of, that's, I think even the Wachinsky sisters had some idea of this when they did the, the architect uh, meeting Neo, where there were TVs all around in a huge circle in the office. Uh, it was, I mean, I saw that in the late 70s, by my, my experience. So um, I'm seeing this and uh, I could go into any of the infinite things that were happening and be there for a million years a million years would be there. And I never left the position I was in, in the center of all that. It was like just that much time, just in a million years. The, the, it came to a point where I felt that I needed to think about that one infinite, infinitesimally small bit that was of a sleeping body in a bed, me in the bed. And I had to go to that. And when I went to that, I saw that the, the face was very pale. The flesh was very cold and pale. And there's something wrong. So I tried to use some of the techniques of Robert Monroe. I tried to flex myself like if, if my conscious were, consciousness, like if you took your arm right now and flex your bicep, it was like my consciousness felt like a muscle flexing to get back in. I tried to wiggle the toes. That was one of the things you learned. You look at the toes were listless. They weren't doing anything. I tried to think to wiggle the toes, uh, think to put an itch on my nose, something, and it wasn't working. And then I became, I, then I realized, oh my God, I've died. I can't, something happened, I can't get back. And so I let, I just went, oh. I just let, let out a kind of awareness sigh, no, no, no mouth to do it, but it was like a, a sighing awareness. And then I, I accepted that I must have died. And then I'm in the room and, and I suddenly feel my awareness becoming very heavy as I relaxed. It was like the flexing was actually in the way. You have to do things in opposite to what you're taught in this reality. Um, and I felt my consciousness sink, sink, sink down and through the floor. And this is something really hard to explain, the paradox of this. I was passing through solid boards and, and carpet and of this trailer in a trailer park in San Pedro, California. And they were solid and I could see inside them perfectly at the same time. They were completely solid and completely not solid at the same time. And as I, my consciousness passed down into the, into the rocky basement underneath the trailer and started coming up again into the trailer, it became so small that as I saw the bed springs coming, they were vast. And my head was, the nape of my neck was approaching me like as if I was in the Millennium Falcon and my head was a planetary size sphere. And the moment that I kind of landed or touched, my awareness touched the nape of my neck, I immediately found myself in the dimensions of my cold, clammy body as if somebody had grabbed me by the neck and whipped me like a rag. The whole body from the head went whap like that. And when that happened, I, I couldn't move. And there was a, a pain in my neck, in the nape of my neck. And that was really the only place where I was feeling anything at all. Everything else feel, felt dead. And I thought, oh my God, I came in too fast. I've hurt myself. I've, I'm, I'm a quadriplegic if I survive this. 
So I couldn't do anything about it. So I simply let go. Crying wasn't going to help. I couldn't call out, just be there. So I was just there laying in the bed. And over the next 30 minutes, very slowly, I began to feel my chest, my arms. And when I got my hands back, I went, oh, great. I can at least use my hands and write and do things and create. I was already given up on getting my legs back. And then slowly, slowly, I got my legs back until I could move my toes. And then I did as I was trained with Robert Monroe. I got on my side, went back to sleep because I had gone in out of sequence. So you, you actually go in, you flow out, come back in and readjust. And then you're really back in proper with your other, with your physical body. Ever since that experience, I have never been quite in my body. It's been sort of a, I mean, I really have a sense inside my inner eye of seeing behind me and around me and below me in, in, in an odd way. So a shadow of that has remained with me. Um, I, for the next six months, I had a twitch in my uh, nape of my neck and it took six months for that to leave. Um, but I've never, never been quite the normally abnormal <laughs> since that time. So why am I giving you this background? Because what I sensed and then experienced, sensed at the age of what, 17 in junior high, and, no, 16 in, in sophomore year of high school in Palos Verdes, California, in Rolling Hills High. Um, and what I experienced again, uh, I think in 1976, with this experience at 21, um, was this idea that until a few weeks ago, I had not seen a scientific parallel to prove that it was possible. And this concept, this idea is that we will, is actually uh, represented by what I call in the final article of my last wave of articles, the cosmic smooch. What it is, is a photograph made from lasers and devices that from the university professors of Glasgow, Scotland, that uh, have basically taken the theory of quantum entanglement and shot a picture of it in action. This is significant stuff. This is basically, if, if those of you in science understand that the whole concept of quantum entanglement had fascinated and spooked out equally, Albert Einstein, you know, the idea that one thing uh, entangled somehow mysteriously with another can communicate itself and repeat itself or change. If this thing here changes, it immediately changes the other thing in another place, another time and space and place. And so it is entangled. Now, in the theory, a lot of scientists were theorizing, well, this could be a whole new form of communication. And it, but Einstein said, I don't see how this theory can work because um, information like mass and physics will, can't go faster than the speed of light. That's at least what he thought. These people have created one side, it looks like a lowercase of lips in a, on a black background uh, with, uh, and it looks just like somebody kissed a window, you know, uh, or it's the kiss in The Martian that the crew member, the geek who did all the computing did on the man she was going to marry later when he's, they're about to blow the front door so they can slow down the spaceship so they can grab uh, the guy who's come up from Mars in that wonderful movie, The Martian, and she, he's got his big space suit on and she kisses the space suit and then she looks at him and says, don't tell anybody I did that. <laughs> and you can see this smooch. So the, the, uh, the lower part, and you can see it in hoagprophecy.com, I have it there. The lower lip, if for want of a better word, is showing how it's affecting the upper one of two. These are two quantums that are, one is changing the other and it's being photographed. And so 
that brings in this idea that I've always had is that thought does not travel by the speed of light. Thought is instantaneous. We'll prove it someday when we do an experiment with a colony on Mars and have a way to measure thought. So I go into some really wild ideas that were a part of my story where I do not see, and maybe in the initial stages, I mean, there's a prophecy of Nostradamus about the world being destroyed by the expanding sun, where it expands as a red giant to the orbit of Earth around the year 3797 AD, about 1800 years from now, a little less. And in his talk about the revolutions of Mars that would continue, in astrology, the revolution of Mars, is seven, the cycle is 700 years. So it's when he talks about people colonizing stars in Aquarius that didn't quite work out, but colonizing stars in the constellation of Cancer that will last, that civilization will be perpetual. That means it's a galactic civilization. It's possible that he's describing some sublight journey that takes 700 years to get to these. Um, and I think in the process, what's going to happen is people are going to understand that it's just too long and too inhuman a journey. I mean, people who live and die on an asteroid, let's say it's been built as a great city, none of those people will, will ever reach the destination. But what if there's a way that's not even using wormholes? What if there's a way to harness the eternity of the present that can work like a black hole that actually around the edges of the eternity of the present is the phenomenon of identity connection that can then, uh, that the people that would run this could have possibly gotten into something like what I had experienced and instantaneously therefore, if they see all the things that are going on all over the galaxy and universe, they can look at the one point where something's happening out of all the infinite points think they're there and they're, they never left. They were already there. And therefore, find a way then in this spherical site concept to actually create a, a vessel and create a way to teleport a physical matter as well as spiritual beings to any place in the universe. In fact, you don't instantaneously go because instant is a movement. It is, I call it Zen teleportation, using the engines of silence. And, and basically, I feel, I talked to Whitley Strieber about this on one of his shows recently, and he's certainly a man who is also a prophet, and also been amazingly accurate, and often thinks of these way out things. And I, I, I was I was pretty impressed when he was impressed by that because he's a man hard to impress <laughs> about all things extraterrestrial. And so, so, you know, with all the travails I've talked about, I guess this happens when you're an expert on Nostradamus, you, you wrestle with the pessimism of the master from Salon de Provence on the 16th century. But I always try to find something positive, even in the things that, that are scary, there are opportunities. There's always an opportunity to grow and expand from anything that happens. Because happiness and sadness, fear and courage, they're all transitory. But if there's something that is experiencing them, that which can never be experienced, that witnesses it, from there is the source of eternity of this kind of travel that I'm talking about without travel. I mean, it's, it's been touched upon by the guild navigators of, of Dune. Science fiction prophets have in their, in their writing hiding under the guise of fiction. Um, Orson Scott Card in his character Jane in Children of the Mind is definitely on the same track as I am about this. It's nice to know. It's nice to know that others, as we were talking earlier about how synchronicity of things, how things come together, Rex, it's, it's, um, it, it's not owned by anybody. It's the gift of the existence. We just have to be sensitive enough to allow 
these things to express themselves through us, like a hollow bamboo played by existence. It's music, a mystery. And with that, I, I end my, my rant. <laughs> and I uh, also would like to ask again, any of you resonate with what I'm saying and feel the energy of what I'm saying, it's often beyond the words, but in between them. If, if you have questions or things that you wish to have another set of eyes look at, um, go to my website. And if you feel like you need a reading, uh, contact me through the Hogue, Bull, uh, Hogue Bulletin, hogueprophecy.com. It's at the website. You click on it. Just put Hogue Reading, and I'll get in touch with you through email. And we'll set up a situation where the very background you see here, my little space station effect, will it'll be as many people have done it already. It says, "Wow, I feel like I'm a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm Rex Barron. I'm with you, and it's a one-on-one -on -one show. <laughs> Only you will be the show. It'll be about your journey that I'll help with my experiences to illuminate." Wow. I mean, you know, you went from a rant, but it moved into a form of poetry, man. That was that was awesome. That was fantastic. And I know that we've gone two hours and I did promise the audience, though, that we would answer at least a, a couple sure. of questions here. Um, you know, I, I when I ask the question, though, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to go outside and make sure that the water, uh, the, the tide isn't up to the front tires yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'm like, okay, hold on, we're backing it up, and I'll be backing it up while, while you're answering the question. We'll figure it out. But yeah, so just let's get to the. I, we're gonna I, do a I would I would hate to hire, have you sing if you're in real trouble. Start singing nearer to God than the like the song they were playing at the Titanic. <laughs> oh yeah, oh that's really scary. No, I can't. Even, man, that was just uh. Remember the I'm on top of the world or something like that. <laughs> Whatever. I liked it when the seagull hit him in the face. So no, was I did. it a seagull crap or was it just a seagull? Oh, it was a seagull. Yeah, no. uh, so it would have been better for the seagull crap. That would have been really <laughs> nice. We just splatted right on his forehead. I'm Blah! on top of the world. <laughs> Take that, Leonardo! You think you're so special? Here's some. Oh, we love Leonardo. He's we amazing. Love him. amazing. Uh, you're amazing. You yeah. are amazing. okay. So, folks, we're going to take some questions now. Yes. And actually, I am going to get this thing converted into four-wheel drive um, once I can um, actually. Anyway, I'm eating <laughs> top ramen for the next six months because that's how I was able to afford this. Um, <laughs> so six months of top ramen. Now, we're going to take questions. The first question is, have you heard of Cowbell? No, the, 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 I'm joking. There's this guy in here called Magic Sufi. He's hilarious. Every other comment is, it's time to play the Cowbell. We need more Cowbell. John's good, but John needs a little more cowbell. Um, so, okay, we're going to so, add... So, no, no, I, I can answer that because I'm a, I'm a dervish. I'm a whirling dervish. One of the things I learned, uh, I, I have a, a Sufi dimension to my work. And, uh, you know, the thing, the thing that happens, though, to if you're, if you're whirling, the amazing thing is that if you're whirling centered in your heart with one hand up and the other down, so it's a conduit, to the world, you can spin effortlessly, fast, 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 and you just let everything blur. You don't look at anything. The funniest thing that happens is, and I will pose this to the your friend here, and if he's a true Sufi, he'll understand. If you say, what about the cowbell? If you start thinking about cowbells when you're whirling, you'll lose your balance. Because whatever your thought is, holy or unholy, if you think while you're whirling, you, you have to say in your heart. So in the heart, the cowbells are ringing. <laughs> cowbells. And we actually spent valuable time talking about that. And that's my fault, John. I think that you, your <laughs> version of it was much better than mine. I, <laughs> you actually made sense with cowbells. I just I did. attempted. I have cows next door. I after after I've talked to publishers, I go and try to get my humanity back by talking to them. <laughs> Hello. Hello. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm doing that. That's, that's good. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, <laughs> Ethel Merman. <laughs> oh, man. This is okay. So, okay. next question. Here we go. The, the, for, there were questions that were mostly asked about an hour ago, and I was hoping the mods were going to take the questions and write them down. So, mods, please do the copy and paste of the questions because I saw some great questions earlier, even by Greg. Greg, you were asking some good questions. You were asking something about what John, what his opinion was on the Hong Kong situation. And uh, there was, it was more detailed. So, we've got about 10 minutes, folks, and then I'm, I'm done for tonight. Uh, then I'm actually going to go hang out at the hotel. I've been sitting on a cooler here in the uh, in the van, and it's it's nice, but it's oh okay. All right, question and answer time. Here we go. Um, the, do you okay? Here's a good question. Here's a good question. Do you think that the current pope is the last pope? Um, I'm actually taking my best-selling book, The Last Pope, which I published uh, in 1998 for for um, Element Books, it actually achieved number one in Amazon of all books at a time. There weren't any eBooks at that time, but it was still competing against two, three million physical books. And it actually stayed at number one for several days. I am in the process of publishing that, hopefully by Christmas, where we will look at this issue and I'll update that because St. Malachi's prophecies are, are my other kind of major thing that I do on other than Nostradamus. And um, it is very likely that he is the last Pope. There, I'm gonna look at the different arguments or discussions and interpretation about that. One of the reasons is that it's because he is kind of broken with a lot of traditions that, that will never come back. Like he likes to only be called the Bishop of Rome. Um, that, uh, but, but that, that's, that's a minor one. But the other possibility is that because he's the last entry of the 112 references to popes from the 1130s, when St. Malachi was purported to have done this, that he is, um, because it, he broke the pattern of just one numbered motto after another, but a whole paragraph about Peter of Rome being the last pope. It's also possible that because Benedict created the apostasy, he was always anticipated by papal prophecy watchers to be the man who would start the crisis in faith, which is central to the apocalyptic views of, of the book of Revelation from the Catholic point of view, which is quite different from the Protestant point of view. The emphasis is on the crisis at the very highest echelons of the church. And that's happening. Uh, he is his, uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is definitely a, a man that has been under a tremendous scandal with the pedophilia and all the things which has harmed credibility of the Catholic Church in ways scarcely seen in the last 16 centuries. So, so it could be that the break has happened the, in the, with the apostasy, Malachi stopped the Latin mottos being one after another. And it's possible that even though many things represent Peter of Rome being uh, Francis, it could be that he, it, the last Pope that's talked about is a jump to the end. And it may not be the last Pope, but it's what happens in the life of the last Pope. It's not made clear whether that's the last pope that follows, mainly because of this break in the pattern of prophecy. So, but but this book, yeah, I'm just giving you a little taste of a few things, but this book will look deeply into this because it'll also look into the Catholic prophecies that if you see them outside of dogmatic uh, anticipation, you will um, you will see that. Uh, there are three cycles in the ministry of the church in, in one prophetic point of view. They each are part of the Trinity, defined by one element of the Trinity. Each are 20 centuries long. The first 20 centuries is the age of the Father. I am a jealous God. I am the Father figure, the Lord of hosts. The second stage in the ministry of, of the earth is the age of the Son. It's 20 centuries of Jesus. 
And that age has come to an end because now we're in this new millennium. This will be the next 20 centuries will be about the age of the Holy Spirit, which is actually where dogma and religion and big business religions and all that, a middleman, a priest, a go-between dissolves and your relationship with the divine is direct. So this book also looks into that. Next question. Fantastic. Thank you, John. And the next question is from Catherine. She says, I'm in Alaska, crazy drought and fires everywhere. What's going on with all these fires all over our planet, such as in Amazon? And thank you. Well, thanks for, you know, I was just in Alaska for the first time in January doing readings in Anchorage. I fell in love with it. I mean, if you can fall in love with <laughs> in January with Alaska, you really love Alaska. And, um, and, and I, I keep in contact with my contact up there, uh, Don Kelly of, of the Atom organization who hosted me, A-T-O-M. Um, and uh, there's 500,000 acres that have been burnt. There are, no, there's, there's like 500 fires also going on. Uh, same, there is an immense fire happening since April ongoing that's burnt 13 million acres in Siberia. And I've been watching the thin layer of its, of its smoke at 8,000 feet. I knew it was 8,000 because I flew down into it when I was doing a film uh, a few weeks ago, doing some TV down in LA for something about aliens. That's all I'll say. It'll be my second episode. <laughs> the, um, the, we started falling through, landing through the smoke at 18,000 feet, and it was thick all the way to 8,000 before we were underneath it. And it, I found out that it, it came all the way from northwest of Bi Lake Baikal in the central part of Siberia. Well, well, if you ask me, and you are, um, uh, I am saying this is exactly what the scientists and even a lot of prophets said would be these kind of things happening when the world's heating up. That uh, the tundra fires, the great fires, I mean, in the case of Amazon, that is willful because the new president of the Amazonia of Brazil has called himself uh, President Chainsaw. I mean, he is, if you just follow the quotes, and in my future Hoke Prophecy articles, we will, um, this man is totally into, he doesn't believe there's any climate change. He wants to exploit. He has all these U.S. business backers. I was just looking at some of the pamphlets that were being shown on RT America about it that, um, that show that, that they basically just want to use up what's there. And that it's the biggest fires that have ever happened. And just to show you some bias that goes on in the news, there are even bigger fires burning up the Congo right now in Africa, but they're not even reported. And also willful presidents and dictators and people just burning it all up. But the good news is a lot of people got pissed off about the Amazon. A lot of world leaders started giving shit to this guy. And he, Bolsonaro had to the president of, uh, had to actually bring in the army to start put out these fires. That's a good sign. So what is what's going on is it's it's climate crisis. It's a climate disruption. We are uh, you know I've spoken on it before. There are different opinions about it. My my opinion. I've been on this since I was 17 years old when I became aware it was coming. Is that we have put enough pollution in the system to unbalance the climate sequestering engines of Mother Nature. Our great forests are burning, they sequester carbon. The permafrost is bubbling in the polar seas. We talked about that in the last show. And that could literally add another 50 gigatons of methane into what would be a three quarter increase of every bit of pollution we put in the system to knock it out of balance since the beginning of the industrial age. And we're doing, and most of this happened starting in the 80s. We've done most of the worst damage just in the last 35 years. And in the next 20 years, if we keep going, 
populations will collapse. Uh, there's, a, as you might know, in Alaska, you know, the pencil fish is disappearing. It's broken the chain of a lot of food chains where islands that used to be filled with seals, islands filled with birds, like in St. Paul, there's no birds anymore. They're disappeared. They died. So Alaska, the farther north you go, or the farther antarctically south you go, you will see more and more dramatic impacts of the climate being changed because these are the, the, the quasi canary in the coal mine. The northern climes and the southern polar climes are telling us what's going to happen here in another 20 years in the temperate zones. Next question. I would like to make a comment because I read a headline and I should have read the whole news article, but the headline was enough to to cause uh, a quick red flag in my mind. Uh, you know, the brain went, eh, red alert, red alert. And it said, no, the Amazon is not the Earth's lungs. You could burn everything on the planet and there'd still be plenty of oxygen. <laughs> I, I was like, wow, <laughs> wow, that's just, whether or not that's true, that's just ridiculous to even leave that comment. I mean, he's like, well, well you're first off, now, aren't you? That tells me that that man's not getting enough oxygen in his brain. He's already lacking oxygen. The science shows that the Amazon is 20% of all the air that's produced, the oxygen that's produced, because of photosynthesis. Um, and it's the biggest forest. Uh, it's also the Congo and the other rainforests of the world are included in that, and they're all disappearing. Here's, here's the headline, The Atlantic. The Amazon is not Earth's lungs. Humans could burn every living thing on the planet and still not dent its oxygen supply. Um, <laughs> I call uh, I call BS on that, and that's my opinion. But you know what? I haven't read all the data. I can't verify that either way. It's like you can say anything unless you verify it, but I can certainly say that sounds like BS to me. That, I mean, every living thing on the planet – Everything, I mean, come on now. You could burn everything and not even dent the oxygen supply. I mean, is there a well, dent in your head? I'm sorry. Is there a dent in your brain? It wouldn't dent the oxygen supply. It wouldn't even dent it. Burn every living thing on the planet and it doesn't dent anything. I'm shocked. Thank you so much. I feel so much better. Let's hook up a 5G tower everywhere and let's just go outside and say, turn up the 5G because we don't need trees. We need 5G. This article says it won't even dent the oxygen supply. It's too fast for download speeds. Come on, John, let's go. <laughs> well, all I can say is that since 1973, I have been looking at the data. I, I, I did learn what science knows about how oxygen is created by uh, the phytoplankton in the ocean, which is the main source. Um, and also the chemical reactions of trees. You know, trees create oxygen, plants create oxygen. They eat carbon dioxide, take it out of the system. That's how they sequester it. Now, if you've got a, a forest, which is one of the largest parts of that engine, um, the calculation is that it is 20% of what creates oxygen. Now, if you burn everything, uh, I mean, that gets into uh, planetary engineering or, or, or the geology of exo, ex, extraterrestrial geology. If you look at planets that have had everything burned, like um, through a nova or something like that, they're just an empty shell. There's no oceans. There's no air. If you could burn everything on the planet like that, you would need oxygen. Oxygen is part of the fuel. Um, if, if, uh, if you burned all the oxygen, uh, you may not have burned everything on the planet, but you won't be alive to breathe it. So yeah, I mean, I mean, the more crazy people get, I, I, there's an adage uh, that I learned from Native American medicine man, man. He said, when the world gets louder and crazier and 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 more frenetic i simply get more silent and still inside and 
that's definitely a path that I've been on since 1980. How to be, how to make the inner eye of perception the eye of the storm of these hurricane times. And uh, my teacher used to call it, Osho used to call it the Noah's Ark of Consciousness. There's no, there's no uh, ark that's going to save people. I get this question at Ailey where, well, is there people, aliens going to save us, give us a mothership, do that? Um, I follow the device at the very least of saying, don't wait for someone else to save you from burning your own finger. Stop burning your finger. You know, the, stop being an arson to your planet. Uh, frankly, if higher intelligence is watching some idiot burn down their own planet, do you think something that advanced would want you on their ship? You might burn it down. <laughs> You're burning your only vessel in space. Duh. <laughs> you know? so, so from that point, I try, I try to be humorous. I try to, I mean, it's good. It's great. But, you know, the other thing too is what you just did, uh, Rex, really everybody's got to do, and it should be done. There's a point in the meditations that I do where you just, you let it all out. You know, you just like, like a lot of us have got all this pent up stuff and frankly, keeping a lid on it is not the way to transcend it. Do it in your privacy, never do it on somebody, you know, but, but do it, throw it out. And there's meditations that I've learned. In fact, in readings I can share, that's the other thing too. If you just wanna freely sample some of the meditations that I do, just go to my website and click on the contact and just put in the subject line meditation. You don't have to do anything else. I'll know exactly what you want and I'll give you this thing that shows the links and information to the wild and playful and wonderful meditations that I've learned that, that allows you to be angry, allows you to be beyond baffled, but like rage against the stupidity of the world. And when you do that, it's fun. And then at the end of it, you feel so much lighter. It's like that energy has been turned into genius. So <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoyed your catharsis. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for listening, John. And I'd also like to thank everybody else for listening. And definitely make sure to check out HoagProphecy.com. We're going to get John back on the show here, hopefully at the end of September. Does that sound good to you, John? Yes, it does. Yes. Yes. All right. We're going to have John back on the show at the end of September, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd also like to let you know that if you go to leakproject.com, you'll get access to exclusive content. And if you also want to check out some incredible podcasts, or should I say, these aren't even really podcasts. These are more like full featured videos with special effects and a higher end budget. If you go to Gaia, dot com slash leak project, you'll get a free membership to see how awesome they really are. I mean, they've got thousands of different videos, everything from spirituality to yoga. I think, John, you have in the past worked with Guy also, haven't you? Yeah, and it just dawned on me, there's this fascinating guy I'd like to turn you guys on to, Ch Chaitan Parkland. He's, um, he's one of the pioneers of a completely new astrological system called the uh, Human Design. And he's one of the main proponents of it. And since yeah, he, he has appeared on Gaia often. And so, yeah, I, I'd love to get you two connected um, and, and uh, check that out. He's, he's a fellow from England. And he used to work in a pipe crew with me uh, in the uh, Oregon Commune in Osho times. Yeah. He's a very interesting guy. He was one of the guys that wrote Osho's jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't heard any of Osho's jokes, so I oh, they're I'm... funny. I have to tell you some. Some <laughs> they are very funny. He had a very straight-faced way of of doing them, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll have to I'll have to do a few of Osho's jokes for you. Some of them are all pretty off-color, but. <laughs> Well, we'll get, we'll do it next time. I've got people parking around the van here. I'm on the beach. I don't know if you know, pretty soon I might have, uh, 
Yeah, they're like, hey, is everything okay in there? What's yeah. The- <laughs> I'll, I'll literally jump out and be like, yo, man, I'm doing a podcast live right now. It's I. It's weird, man. I do podcasts and police officers show up and they're so cool. Like at 4.30 in the morning, I'm at China Lake. I'm right by the entrance, really close to the entrance. I guess on the outskirts a little bit to the military base, but this was after there was that earthquake there. And I'm live streaming at four something in the morning. And this this like sheriff drives by and he's like, hey. I'm like, hey, man, I'm live streaming. He's like, oh, yeah, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, see you. And he's, they're just, you know, I'd be thinking, hey, man, what are you doing? Hey, they're going to check out your life. And they're like, oh, <laughs> okay, see you. It's cool. I'm, you know, I was like, yeah, man. So anyway, uh, maybe they're watching the live stream as they're pulling up. They're like, yeah. <laughs> it's all I'll good. be your character witness. <laughs> What's that? I'll be your character witness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got we've got almost a thousand people watching us live. Um, <laughs> right on, John. You're awesome. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here with us. You're amazing. Be excellent to each other. Hit the subscribe button. There's a lot of people that have said they they aren't getting uh, the live stream updates. So just make sure to click the bell. Um, there's a bell that you can click that will give you access to the live feeds that I do. Sometimes I do three or four a day, and then you can hear John and I talk at the very beginning. Beginning. So hit that subscribe, hit the bell, be excellent to each other, and be the change you want to see. Thanks, John. Bye, everybody. Na, 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 na.